Good morning. Good morning. We're glad you're here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Why don't we stand? I know you just sat down some of you. <laughs> And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for a new day. Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for bringing us here this morning, Lord God. Thank you that you have a plan for each one of us this morning, Lord God, and as a group and as individuals, Lord God. And we look forward to what you're going to do. May our hearts expect from you, God, because of who you are. Pray for your anointing on the worship, God. We pray that it be a wonderful time being in your presence and that these hearts would choose to rejoice in the God of their salvation. Bless our time together, Father, as we look to you. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Praise God. He's good. Happy day. Greatest day in history. Let's 
mingle a bit, say hello to someone, introduce yourself. Great is our God, sing with me how will never end. We'll continue to worship you and praise you forever and ever and ever, Lord God. And one day we'll see you face to face. We look forward to that day, Lord God. And we'll know you as you are. How can we not but look forward to that day, Lord? But until then, Lord, we're in bodies. And we need to hear from you. We need to have understanding, Lord God, of you. We need to know your heart. Well, this morning, we pray that you would teach us, Lord God, those things. And that our hearts would be open to you, Lord, and your ways and your thoughts, Lord God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. We are in the book of Acts this morning, so if you have your Bibles, turn it to Acts chapter 23. Acts 23. Tell me when you're there. Somebody say hair or there. <clears throat> there. Okay, raise your hand if you're there. Okay. Two lawyers were sitting down having lunch. And one lawyer said to the other, guess what? He said what? I'm going to start teaching Sunday school. And the guy looked at him and he says, are you kidding me? He says, you don't even know the Lord's Prayer. He says, what are you talking about? And he started quoting, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. What do you mean I don't know the Lord's Prayer? The other lawyer said to him, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were so biblically informed. Now, if you're laughing because you know that isn't the Lord's Prayer, I'm glad for that. <clears throat> but there are a lot of people in the church who do not know the Bible and who do not believe the Bible. Let me tell you a staggering statistic that I heard this week. 5% of the church today, and it's gone down 50%. For the first time in the history of America as a nation, 
we are less than 50% attending church in America. And out of that 50%, only 5% believe, 5% believe that the Bible is the word of God and everything that it says is from God. Now, I want you to be honest this morning. I know you're honest. I'm not saying that you're not honest. <laughs> How many believe that without a doubt, this is the infallible, inspired word of God, and everything it says is from God. Amen. 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 Okay. I do too. You are 5%. That's all. And we wonder why the church is confused. We wonder why things are not happening that the church goes along with that are totally contrary to the Word of God. A lot of it's because of ignorance, not knowing. And this is why we teach through every single book in the Bible, every single one. And that's why we teach line upon line, precept upon precept, so you will know the Bible in its whole contents. Okay, Acts chapter 23. Paul has spoken to the Jewish crowd about his testimony of his B.C. years, before Christ years, of how he was a Jew and how he had been taught by one of the greatest teachers ever, Gamaliel, and how he was taught according to the strictness of his fathers, the law, and how he was zealous for God. And he persecuted the way, the Christians. He put some in prison, some in jail, he put, some even brought to bring into a place of death. That's how zealous Paul was. But he gives this testimony about how he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And how it totally changed him. And how Jesus appeared to him and spoke to him in a dream. And Paul asked the Lord in that dream, or I'm sorry, not in a dream, but in a vision. Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth. Why are you persecuting me? And he said, Lord, what shall I do? And he told him what he should do. And I want to remind you, <clears throat> Paul's testimony is what he's sharing with the people who really are angry at him and upset with him. He is sharing what God has done in his life. Every single Christian in this room today who has become born again, and that's every Christian, has a testimony of what God has done in their life. Every single Christian has BC years, before Christ, before you knew Christ. What kind of person you were, how you acted, what you did, even going against the gospel. Paul went completely against everything that was God. He thought he was doing what God wanted him to do, but he was 100% wrong. And every one of us in our testimony have something to share with this world of the things that God has done. I've seen God change drug addicts, alcoholics, I've seen God change and do miraculous things, but I want to say this to you. <clears throat> Sometimes we look at people who God has done such a work on, and we think it has to be something like somebody who's been a horrific person or lived a horrific life. God had to intervene because he was hooked on heroin and he was an alcoholic for 25 years or some huge thing. And we think that the people who have never been involved in these kind of things don't need a testimony or don't need God in the same way as somebody who is in so much sin and bondage. <clears throat> Let me explain something to you and don't ever forget it. Before God, there is the lost and there is the found. The 
found are those who know Christ and have been born again. The lost are those who have never accepted Christ. It doesn't matter if you're a banker and you are a successful man in banking and you're a good husband or you're a good wife. It doesn't matter if you're totally successful in the world. If you have sinned once and every person has many times, before God you are a sinner. When a person accepts Christ, no matter what their BC years have been, God forgives them and they become a child of God and a new beginning happens. That's how it works for every single person. Every person is a sinner and needs forgiveness. That's one of our, that should be all our testimony in some way or another. So Paul is sharing his testimony and it's a day later he's been arrested And Paul now is standing before the religious leaders. And that's where our chapter starts. It says in verse 1, Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in good conscience before God until this day. And the priests are the high priest, and Ananias, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Well, you sit to judge me according to the law, and you do the command, you command me to be struck contrary to the law. So, so again, he's got, he's right before the Supreme Court, so to say, of the Jewish leaders, <clears throat> And as he's explaining this about what has happened, Ananias, the high priest, has somebody smack him in the face. And Paul didn't have a temper, not. And so he says to him, you're nothing but a, white wall, a whitewashed wall. So what is he telling him and what is he calling him? What he's telling him is, you look really good on the outside. You got it all together on the outside. Your hair is all combed. You look nice. You smell good. You're clean. You wear nice clothes. Everything looks good on the outside. But he says, inside, you're a hypocrite. You're a faker. You don't, you don't play or you don't do what you say you do. You just pretend to be somebody you're not. Now. That's a pretty heavy thing to say, to supposed to be the holiest man on earth, so to say, the high priest. And to Paul is telling the truth. Many of the religious leaders at this time, and Jesus makes a statement to many of them, that they were actors, they were pretending to be something they weren't. Let me tell you what God looks at this morning. <clears throat> God doesn't look at your exterior. God doesn't say, you know, you're looking fine. You don't drink no more. You don't smoke no more. You don't do those kind of things. You're looking good on the outside. God says, I could care less what's going on, on the outside. Now, that, I'm not making, I don't mean that God doesn't care about you sinning. That's not what I'm talking about. God cares about you if you're destroying your body. What God looks at you this morning, and every time that God looks at you, he looks straight into your heart. That's what he looks at. He sees what's going on with you. Because I, he knows that's where life comes from. And that's where all the function of life comes from. Out of the heart, heart flow, all the issues of life, Proverbs says. And that's what's happening. And so when God looks at you, he sees that. He sees your heart. He sees if you want to be pure or you don't want to be pure. He sees if you're repenting or not repenting. He doesn't look at the outside. And God doesn't work on the outside. God works on the inside. And when you're changed on the inside, you become what God wants you to become. God doesn't want us to be a hypocrite. And let me say this to you. Every one of us in this room and every person ever born has been a hypocrite, has been an actor sometime or another. What it should be is this. What you see is what you get. That's how it should be. 
And so Paul calls these religious people <coughs> hypocrites. Let's look at 4 and 5. And those who stood by him made this statement, Do you revile God's high priest? But Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak of, of a ruler of your people, evil. So Paul made a mistake, and he's wrong here. And he quotes the scripture about how he is wrong. Now, I'm kind of encouraged in a way before we go to the main part of this scripture. And that is because Paul has been walking with God for 20 years now when he writes this. He is a man that has written or writes, I believe, 11 books or 13 books of the New Testament. He is a man that God speaks to, I believe, every day. And he is a man who's completely sold out to God, but he still blows it sometime. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> but how many of you this week blew it sometime or another? And you probably said, Ugh, I did it again. I said it again. <clears throat> we have good company. His name is Paul, the apostle. And he blew it. But let me share this with you also, this thought. The Christian life is a life of growing. It is a life of becoming more and more like Jesus. We don't ever arrive until we see him face to face. And in knowing that, we need to have grace upon ourselves and for others. We're going to make mistakes. Let me read a couple of scriptures to you with that same thought in mind. Psalms 103.10. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. In other words, God knows how we are. He knows that we're weak. He knows that we make mistakes and we're going to fail at times. But remember, God always looks at our heart to see where our heart is. I never want to sin. I never want to make a mistake. I, I never want to do wrong purposefully. I know what the scripture says, and I'm a really accountable more than you are because I know what it says. And I never want to sin, but I still do. And God understands and God knows I still have that human nature that I'm fighting on a regular basis. I'm always fighting that old man, that old flesh, just like you are. And God understands that. Listen to what this next verse says. Psalms 103, verse 14. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. What are you? You're dust. God made you from dust. In other words, you're weak, you're vulnerable, you make mistakes. Again, God looks at the heart. Now, just like Paul here, we are going to be wrong at times. But how do we deal with wrong? Paul admits he is wrong and quotes the word of God or why he was wrong. <clears throat> If you are wrong, we must admit it to God and to man if necessary. So let's look at another example of how, what we can learn from concerning being wrong and how to deal with it. You have to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Tell me when you're there. 2 Samuel chapter 12. You have to have more theirs than that. All right. Here we go. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 1 starts and says, 
But the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and one was poor. The rich man owed a great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb that he had bought. He raised that little lamb and grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate and drank from his cup. He cuddled in his arms like a baby daughter. One day a guest arrived at his home, a rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. And he must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. Ooh. The Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king of Israel and I saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you master's, your master's house and his wife and his kingdom of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you more, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For well, you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Amorites and stolen his wife. For this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I'll make it this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. I want you to notice something about David. This was all fulfilled in the matter of about 15 years through his son Absalom. What God said when prophesied would happen exactly happened like he said. But I want you to notice what David does not do. He doesn't make excuses. He doesn't blame anyone else, but he says, I have sinned against the Lord. He doesn't even bring up Bathsheba's name. God will take care of Bathsheba if that is needed. David has a heart broken over his sin, which he's totally different from Saul, the first king. Beloved, David could have said, judge me not, lest you be judged. Or he could have said, that's none of your business, that's between me and the Lord. Or he could have been angry and said, who do you think you are? I'm the king of Israel. How dare you question me and what I've done? But he doesn't do any of those things. <clears throat> what he does do, he admit, I'm wrong. I made a mistake. I blew it. It had nothing to do with you. Yeah, you may have tempted me, but I made the choice to sin, whatever it may be. I bring this up because I think it's so important for our times that we live, beloved. Our society has established so many people to their destruction by not dealing honestly with them. They are never told what they are doing is wrong and it's going to kill them. Many of you probably remember who Ted, Ted Koppel was. How many remember? Nightline. One night on NBC Nightline, he said this, we have actually convinced ourselves that slogans will save us. Shoot up if you must, but use a clean needle. Or enjoy sex whenever and with whomever you wish, but protect yourself. No, the answer is no. Not because it isn't cool or smart, or because you might wind up in jail or dying of AIDS, but because it's wrong. When Moses brought down from the Mount of Sinai were not the Ten Suggestions, but the Ten Commandments. Now, God sent Nathan to David because he loved David. 
David's response, I responded the way God wanted us to respond when he sends someone, I was wrong. There are going to be times that God is going to send somebody into your life. It may be from this pulpit. And it's going to tell you, hey, you're wrong. God has corrected me so many times. Even of an attitude. And I want God to do that because it's not because of God being angry at me. I don't serve a God and you don't serve a God and know a God who's angry with you. God loves you and he's working with you as a father works with his son. Amen? Amen. So let me ask this question before we go on. How good are you? And none of us are good at this unless we practice this on a regular basis about dealing with things that God confronts you with that are wrong. The Holy Spirit lives in you as a Christian, every one of us, and he convicts us. And he's working in our hearts, in our lives, to prepare us for this place called heaven. So yield, and when you're wrong, and you may have to admit it to men, honey, I've said this to my wife, I can't tell you how many times, not as much as it used to be, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And I used to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, but, I know none of you did that, so we need to get rid of the but. This gets in the way. Now he goes on in verse 6. Well, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees, he cried out to the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead. So we see two different types of people. Paul knows these people. As a matter of fact, he was a Pharisee himself. And both of these people, are these sects, have two different types of beliefs. And Paul knows it, so Paul, what he does is he sets them apart in the sense of separates them. Now he divides them. Listen to what verse 7 says. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees that were, that were assembled, and he divided them. Paul was a very wise man. Now, I want to use this for a springboard in the sense of being careful of being divided. We should never go against the Word of God. The Word of God should be our manual, no matter what happens, what the Scripture says. This is what we believe, and this is what we stand for. If it's against what I say, then I'm wrong. I don't care. I'm wrong, period. So this should never divide us. It should bring us closer. Maybe we have a little bit of different belief in the sense of you may believe the rapture is in the beginning of before the tribulation. You may believe it's in the middle of the tribulation. You may believe it's after the great tribulation. But that should never divide us. We should always be at one by bringing the word into vision, so to say. And I began to think about things that have divided the church recently. Probably the greatest division that has ever happened in my lifetime as being a Christian is this thing called COVID. That divided the church so immensely. So many people believe that they should not take the shot. I'm one of them. I didn't take the shot, and I thank God I didn't take the shot. Now, if you took the shot, I'm not against you in any way. That's between you and God. That's your choice. But I have a choice also, and my choice was not to take it. Okay? So should that divide us? No, but it divided the church immensely. How about the masks? 
I'm not against masks. If a person wants to wear a mask, that's okay. That's between them and them, them and God. If they want to wear a mask when they're sick, they have the flu or they're feeling bad, we'd rather you stay home when you're real sick like that. But if you come, you wear a mask, I'm okay with that. But if I don't wear a mask, don't say anything about me not wearing a mask. Don't let the enemy lie to you about that. Then there's people who, because of fear, even today, will not go to church because of COVID. And the fear, I don't think, is so much about the COVID itself. I think the fear is more driven because of they're afraid of death or they're afraid to die. I can't tell you how many Christians today are held into captivity because of fear. Let me explain something to you. I don't want to go into that very deep. I just want to say one thing. In the book of Psalms, 139, it says this, that when you're in your mother's womb, God put you together and gave you the color of hair. Some of you, God gave you a little thin hair. So now you don't have any. <laughs> but God gave you the color of your eyes. God gave you the sex that he gave you, man or male or female, period. Amen. That's it. And then God said, I'm going to number your days. I'm going to give you exactly how many days I'm going to give you. It's my choice, God said. So you may be lived to be 96 years, four days, four hours, four seconds, period. God says that. So I don't need to have to fear death in any way. But those things have divided the body of Christ so greatly. And God never wants us to be divided. A house divided cannot stand. So Paul uses this and he divides them. Verse 28 says, And the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and no angels or spirit, but the Pharisees confessed both. And then there rose a loud cry, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if the spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let him not fight against God. Now, and there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded that the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring them into the barracks, or bring him into the barracks. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so we must also bear witness at Rome. This is really a good part of the scripture. Every part's good. This must have been a difficult night for Paul. Sometimes we look at people like Paul and we think he never had anything hard. Everything went perfect, smooth. His heart longed for the salvation of the fellow Jews. And two great opportunities came to nothing. Perhaps with tears, Paul mourned these lost opportunities for God and how he might have spoiled them. But Paul was bold and very courageous and even fearless during, this, during the days. But the night loneliness finds him, his strength gone. And the enemy is never slow to take advantage of that fact. It was in the darkness of the night when his fears came upon Paul. When he trusted in God, seems to falter. When he worried about what God was going to do and if he was going to make it. It was in the darkness of night when he became so discouraged. And it will be the darkest of night that you feel at times so discouraged. But it was also the darkness of that night that Jesus came to Paul and stood by him. Amen. It says here, but the following night the Lord stood by him and literally became present to 
Paul. Jesus physically became present. He manifested himself to Paul in a new, unique way. Now, the Bible teaches us in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, that God would always be with us wherever we go, no matter what happens in our lives. Jesus knew where Paul was. He had not lost sight of Paul because he was in jail. When John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, was in jail, a man visited him and said, Friend, the Lord sent me to you, and I have been looking in half of the prisons in England for you. John Bunyan replied, I don't think the Lord sent, me to you, sent you to me, because if he had, you would have come here first. <laughs> God knows I have been here for years, John Bunyan said. God knows where you are today, even if you are hiding it from everyone else. God knows where you are. Paul was alone, but he wasn't alone. If everyone else forsook him, Jesus was enough. Now, Paul had been miraculously delivered from jail cells before, but this time the Lord met him right in the jail cell. We often demand that Jesus deliver us out of our circumstances when he wants to meet us right in them. We sometimes think we are surrendering to Jesus when we really are only demanding an escape. God wants to meet us in whatever we face at the moment. The Lord will stand by our sides, encouraging and seeing us through all, especially at night and in discouraging times. So this morning, let me ask you this question. Are you going through discouragement times? If you are not, praise the Lord, but you are going to sometime soon go through discouraging times. Turn with me to Acts chapter 12. Peter had a similar experience of Paul's, as Paul did. Acts chapter 12, verse 7 through 11. Tell me when you're there. Boy, that was fast. It says this, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and light shined into the prison. And he smote Peter on the side, and he raised him up, saying, Arise, quickly. And his chains fell from his hands. And the angel said to him, Gird up thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did, and he said to him, Cast thy garments about thee, and follow me. And he went out, and he followed him, and he did not know that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. And they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the, unto the iron gate that led into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out, and they passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know for surety that the Lord has sent an angel, and he hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from the expectation of the people of the Jews." There are going to be times in your life as a child of God that you're going to feel like Paul does here. But remember, others will face the same thing you face, and God will meet you there. You won't stand alone. Now, there will be times in your life that God is going to deliver you just like he did these men. But there are going to be times when God is not going to deliver you right away, just like Paul. And he will let you know he is with you, and he will see you through, and his grace will be sufficient for you. I know that some of you are going through this same situation that we're talking about. Times that are hard. It might be sickness. I don't know what it is, but God does. Wait on God. Trust God. And accept his grace that will be sufficient for you. The scripture goes on and says, and Jesus said, be of good cheer, Paul. <laughs> 
The word be of good cheer means to be courageous. Be not discouraged, Paul. Let not what has happened sadden thee. Let, not be, let yourself not be frightened, Paul. The word in the Greek has been translated in another place, be of good courage. Jesus said this on many occasions. When the disciples were in the ship trying to go across the other side, and Jesus came walking on the water, they were frightened. They thought they were seeing a ghost. He said, be of good courage, Paul, uh, disciples. You guys are scared to death, but be of good courage. I'm in charge. Be of good cheer. Cheer is only one word in the original Greek. And it's used five times in the New Testament, each time by Jesus. Let me read them to you. They're short. Jesus told the bedridden paralytic, paralytic, Son, be of good courage, or be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. That's in Matthew 9, 2. In Matthew 9, 22, Jesus told the women, with 12 years of bleeding, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. Matthew 14, 27, Jesus told the frightened disciples on the Sea of Galilee, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. John 16, 33, Jesus told the disciples that night before his crucifixion, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And the last one is here, Acts 23, 11. Jesus told Paul to be of good cheer. Paul was told to be of good courage. Shows that he was discouraged. Oh, how easy it is to sink into the difficulties of life and then ask ourselves the questions of why, of why's of this life, as if we could go back and try to change what is. But all that can be done to take us into a deeper despair. Paul is sinking, and so the Lord came and stood by him. Be of good cheer, Paul. Be good, be of good courage, Paul. This morning, let me ask you this question. Are you discouraged? I'm discouraged with this world out there. It seems to get harder and become harder and harder toward God. And it seems to become more evil and more evil, doesn't it? It goes on in verse 12. And when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under the oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they killed Paul. So let me show you with what's happening. There's 40 men who decide they're going to make an oath. An oath is a covenant. And this covenant means literally, if I don't do this, then let God send me to the deepest part of hell where I will burn. So my point is, and their point is, it's pretty serious. I don't think any of you in this room would say, I'm willing to do this, and God, if I don't do this, Send me to hell and burn, may I burn in the deepest place. I don't think any of you are in that place. I hope you're not. But this is exactly what these men are doing. And let me tell you, they think they're doing the will of God. They think what they're doing is exactly what God would have them to do, is kill this man named Paul, who is sent from God and has God's blessing upon him. They actually thought that they were pleasing God. Let me talk just a moment about oaths, vows. We as Christians need to be very careful of vows. If we say that we're going to do something, we need to say, we need, we need to say it, but we need to do it no matter what. Unless it's a bad vow, as we will see in just a moment. But the Bible teaches about not taking vows, period. I'm not talking about vows in marriage. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm going to do this, God. You see, what happens to us is many, in many times, in many instances, 
is that when life gets really hard and get, gets really tough or things are going wrong and we get into a, a sticky place, sometimes we'll say to God, I'll make this, we don't say, I'll make this vow, but what we say is, okay, God, if you do this, I'll do that. How many have done that? I have. I haven't done it for a long time. Since I learned the scripture. But God tells us in the book of Matthew to not make vows. Let your yes be yes and your no be no, he says. So you have to turn with me to the book of Judges, chapter 11. And this is the last scripture we'll turn to. Verse 29, tell me when you're there, Judges. Talking about a vow. Judges chapter 11, verse 29. Need a few more theirs. At that time, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he went throughout all the land of Gilead and Manasseh, including Mizpah and Gilead. And from there he led an army against the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. He said, if you will give me victory over the Ammonites, I will give to the Lord whatever comes out of my house to meet me when I return in triumph. I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering to Jephthah, led his army against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave him victory. He crushed the Ammonites, devastating about 20 towns from Ariar to an area named Minneth, and as far as away as abath Kirimim. In this way, Israel defeated the Ammonites. When Jephthah returned home to Mizpah, his daughter came out to meet him, playing on a tambourine and dancing for joy. She was his one and only child. He had no other sons or daughters. When he saw her, he tore his clothes in anguish. Oh, my daughter, he cried out, you have completely destroyed me. You have brought disaster on me, for I have made a vow to the Lord, and I cannot take it. I cannot take it back. And she said, Father, if you have made a vow to the Lord, you must do to me what you have vowed, for the Lord has given you a great victory over your enemies, the Ammonites. But first let me do this one thing. Let me go up and roam in the hills and, the, and weep with my friends for two months, because I will die a virgin. You may go, Jephthah said, and he sent her away for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never have children. When she returned home, her father kept the vow he had made, and she died a virgin. So it has become a custom in Israel for young Israelite women to go away from four days each year to lament the fate of Jephthah's daughter. There are bad oaths or bad vows, and we should not keep them, and this is one of them, I believe. There are some commentators who believe that Jephthah offered her life as a sacrifice to God, and God never required that. Beloved, we can all make at times a deal with God. Anything to try to persuade him to see it our way. We can try all sorts of methods or manipulation to get others to go along with our plans, but that doesn't make it right. So we need to be careful of the oaths we make to God, for God takes oaths very seriously. Don't make one to God unless you are going to keep it. And I want to read one scripture to you concerning that same thought, oaths. Numbers 30, 1 and 2. And Moses spoke unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. If a man vows a vow unto the Lord, or swears an oath to bind his soul for a bond, he shall not break the word, he shall, not, he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. We're almost done. Verse 14, 13 and 14. Now, there were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. They came to the chief priests and the elders, and they said, We have found or bound ourselves under a great oath that we may eat nothing until we have killed Paul. 
I want to say this, they knew all the commandments. These were very religious men, and the leaders knew all the commandments. They knew that they should not kill, and they still were in favor and still did it. And they all came together and came against Paul to kill him. They not only avoided the word of God because of what they wanted to do themselves. Now, therefore, now you, therefore, verse 15, together with the council, suggest to the commander that we, he be brought down to you tomorrow as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him. But we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So when Paul's sister, son, heard of the ambush, he went and he entered the barracks and he told Paul. Then Paul, verse 17, calls one of the centurions to him and said, take this young man to the commander for he has something to tell him. So he took him and he brought him to the commander and he said, Paul, the prisoner called me to him and he asked me to bring this young man to you. He has something to say to you. And the commander took him by the hand, went aside and asked privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask that you bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire more fully about him. But do not yield to them, for more than 40 of them lie in wait for him, men who have bound themselves by an oath that they will ne neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you have revealed these things to me. And he called for two of the centurions, saying, Prepare 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night, and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. And he wrote a letter to the following manner, Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. Coming with troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before the, their council. I found out that he was accused concerning questions of the law, but had nothing charged against him, deserving of death or of chains. And when it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man, I sent him immediately to you and also commanded his accusers to state before you the charges against him. Farewell. So God intervenes and takes him and saves Paul like he said he, he did, and he was going to send him to Rome, and that's where it ends. So, what did God speak to you this morning through the word of God? There's something God wants to remind you of. Maybe God spoke to you about when you're wrong, you're wrong, and admit you're wrong. Maybe God spoke to you about discouragement. I'm with you, God says. Or maybe God spoke to you about vows, not taking vows. I don't know what God spoke to you, but I know he spoke something to every one of you this morning. For God is faithful to speak to his people. So grab a hold of God's word. Let it seed in your heart and let it God produce what he wants to produce in you. It'll make you more like Jesus. Father, we are grateful for the word of God. And we thank you, Lord God. Your word will not come back void. That it'll produce what you say it'll produce. It'll bear much fruit in our hearts, Lord God. And Father, we know that's your part, but what is, what is our part, Lord God? To receive it and to keep our hearts soft, Lord God. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to guard our hearts from anything contrary to you, Lord God. And whatever you worked, God, thank you for working in us this morning. Thank you for your love, God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Okay, before we close, there's one thing I wanted to announce. I feel like the Lord has spoken to me about doing something I think is important for you, and it has to do with prophecy. Raise your hand if you believe in prophecy. Let me explain what prophecy is, first of all. It's proclaiming the truth. When I teach the Word of God, that's prophecy. I'm foretelling the truth. That's what the word means. 
But in that foretelling of the truth, there is also a foretelling of what the future holds of God says concerning the future. The Bible consists of almost one third of prophecy and many of it's being fulfilled from before our eyes. That earthquake in the book of, our the earthquake in the Turkey happened this last couple of weeks. And the Bible specifically speaks of earthquakes in the last days in the book of Matthew, chapter 24. So I, I'm thinking, and this is my thoughts, I'm wanting to, after service on Saturday next Sunday, is I want to show a 15 minute, minute video. Let me give you an example. On the first video, it's going to be on the WEF, World Economic Forum. Recently, they met about two weeks ago, and the Bible speaks about in the last days, there's going to be a one world government and one world religion. And this is what they are already, this is on their webpage, what they want to do. Okay, so we were going to talk about that. What we'll do is we'll show the video. And then we'll talk, I'll give you some more scripture on it, a little bit more teaching. Then we'll answer questions concerning that. Every week we want to do that. But what we want to do it is that we're going to give a 10-minute break or 15-minute break in, after service. So you can get your kids if you want to bring them over here. We can be as a family. But that's what we want to do start, starting next week. What do you think? Raise your hand if you want to do something like that. Okay, all right, that's good. Brother Dave will be up here, and so will Pastor Ken and myself to answer questions concerning that. So we'll start that next week. I'm looking forward to it because we, we live in the last days concerning prophecy. I'm telling you, beloved, there's so many scriptures being fulfilled right before our eyes. It's unbelievable what's happening. I read so many different articles concerning what's happening in the scientific world, what they're trying to do. It, it'll blow your mind what's happening. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. But we'll be able to see those and we'll be able to use scriptures, exactly what the Bible says concerning that happening. Okay? So I'm looking forward to a start next week after service. Why don't we stand? Ty, would you lower those lights, please? It's so nice to be in the house of the Lord with God's people. It's so nice to know that God has a plan for our lives. That God's working in our lives and God's control of, in control of our lives. Nothing happened by perchance. Thank God I've learned in, more than anything else I've learned concerning God and being in ministry that he's faithful. Even when I'm not faithful, God's 100% faithful all the time. All the time. And God will be faithful to you. Maybe this morning you've never accepted Christ as your Savior. I need to present the gospel to you. It's very simple. You must believe Jesus came down from heaven. He died and he arose. You must believe you're a sinner. You must ask God to forgive your sins. And then you must ask Christ to come into your heart and live. And the Bible says he will. And then you become born again. The Holy Spirit comes in and lives in you. He washes you and cleanses you from all guilt and condemnation. He gives you a new life. That's what God offers to every single person ever born. If you've never done that, please do that this morning. Maybe this morning you need prayer for something. We have pastors up here. And I think Tony's here this morning. If Tony wants to come up. We'd love to pray for you. If you want to come up to the altar during the worship, we would love to uh, have you come up and kneel before the Lord and talk to the Lord. And maybe you, you want to, I don't know, between you and God, do something special. There's nothing like coming to God's altar. So we feel, we feel free to do that. May God richly bless you this morning. May you continue to look to him. May you fall in love with him more and more every day of your life. And may he be the Lord of your heart and the Lord of your life. We'll sing a couple of songs and be dismissed. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. And I'm going to tell you for sure about the Super Bowl, who's going to win. <laughs> it's going to be a Christian quarterback. They're both Christians.
my way Still you're there right beside Be my guide, hold me by your side. 